I'm Nima Rajan, and this is Forum Daily Week in Review. Markets worldwide are back to tumbling on Thursday as worries about a fragile economy roar back to the forefront. The S&P 500 was 2.8 percent lower in early trading, more than reversing its blip of a 1.5 percent rally from a day before. And analysts had warned of more big swings. This comes as deep uncertainties loom over the Federal Reserve and other central banks' ability to manage inflation. And it's a narrow path of hiking interest rates, enough to slow high inflation, but not so much that they cause a recession. Joining us now to give us his outlook on the markets and whether investors should be concerned is Brendan Caldwell, director of Caldwell Securities Limited. Brendan, welcome back to Forum Daily. Thank you, Nima. Couldn't have picked a better day, could you? Definitely, definitely. Now, we mentioned the U.S. Federal Reserve just raised interest rates by 0.75 percent. We're hearing from economists that the Bank of Canada is likely to mirror that move next month. But what does all of this mean for consumers regarding their credit cards, mortgages and overall debt? Well, if you're if you're carrying floating rate debt, credit card or any debt that can float higher, you really should look to get that paid off or to switch it to a fixed rate if you can or something, because my strong view is that interest rates are going to go much higher from here. The Bank of Canada and the U.S. Federal Reserve has signaled as much. So if you have the ability to uh, pay off your debt or put a fixed term on your debt, whether it's your mortgage or anything else, I'd make that happen. Some important advice there. Now, I've heard of the term stagflation a lot at this time. Uh, what does that mean, and are we in it, Brandon? It means I'm eight or nine years old again. Uh, Jimmy Carter's president of the United States. Interest rates are on their way into the double digits, and the economy is not growing. So it's the world we had in the late 70s, where prices were rising seemingly out of control, and yet the economy wasn't growing. So stagflation is the, co- the, the combination of stagnation and inflation, which from an economist or a real person's point of view is the worst of all worlds. And it's interesting that we've been experiencing a bull market for over a decade now, Brendan, but there hasn't been a lot of talk about a bear market, which we're in right now. So why is it called a bear market in the first place? Well, there are a number of explanations. Uh, the analogy of bull and bear Bull is a market that's going up. I guess it means like it's charging ahead. And a bear market is where it claws back all of those gains. And it is hair like this. So it uh, it a bear market is one where you've got a correction of more than 20%. And uh, a number of the major, particularly U.S. indexes, are in bear market territory now. The Canadian market, because of the preponderance of natural resources, particularly energy and gold, have held up somewhat better. Uh, but the, the, the uh, tech-heavy indices in the U.S. have come off quite a bit. You can see why investors are concerned. So should they consider selling everything right now and staying in cash? Um, only if you have a uh, near and pressing need for the money. All money is meant to be spent. So if you know in three months or six months you're buying a house or you needed this for this or that specific purpose, then yes, Probably, because I cannot tell you how it's going to be in three or six months. But if you have time, as we've discussed before, I would consider adding to this market, not all at once, but put in $1,000 this month. Do $1,000 next month. I cannot tell you whether this month or next month's purchase will be right or wrong. But if you've done the first purchase, whether the market goes up or down, the next one becomes that much easier. And as you start to accumulate money in savings, in investments, that will grow over time, almost no matter what the market does, because eventually it will recover, even from the worst of bear markets. There's always a light at the end of the tunnel, uh, Brendan. Now, just about a minute left here. I want to jump to the R word, recession. We're hearing a lot of concerns around a recession, considering these interest rate hikes. Are we there yet? Are we in it? What are your thoughts, Brendan? Well, the light at the end of the tunnel can also be a train, as you know, Nima. But uh, recessions generally follow uh, interest rate hikes when they're pointed like they have been now. And that's actually kind of the point of the interest rate hikes themselves is to slow down the economy. Uh, But they usually follow them like a year, 18 months after interest rates start to be hiked. Um, In the interim, you're still going to see, I think, wage pressures and inflation pressures. Some of it demand driven, people demanding higher wages, but some of it is also supply driven because there is still a shortage of 
numerous commodities and uh, from houses to oil to bread wheat. So uh, I think you're going to see inflation, possibly stagflation ahead of possibly a recession over the next 18 months. But it doesn't necessarily mean people should be running for the hills because here and there, there will be opportunities in the market. Public health officials in Montreal say the city is the epicenter of the monkeypox outbreak in North America. Montreal is offering a vaccine to all men who have sex with men, including sex workers and those who are visiting the city. Quebec Interim Public Health Director Dr. Luc Boileau says there are 132 confirmed cases of the disease in Quebec, with the vast majority of those cases in Montreal. Officials say three people have been hospitalized since the beginning of the outbreak, but all of them have been discharged. Well, joining us now to give us our weekly medical segment is Dr. Abhishek Rout, Medical Director at Apple Tree Medical Group. Sir, welcome back to Forum Daily. Pleasure to be here. So how many cases of monkeypox have been reported in the rest of Canada so far compared to Montreal? Right. So as of June 10th, Canada had a total of 112 confirmed cases. We had one in British Columbia, four in Alberta, nine cases in Ontario and 98 cases in Quebec. Since then, so just five days ago, uh, Quebec has now seen a 34 percent increase in cases to 132. Of those 132 cases, 126 cases were detected in Montreal. So that represents essentially an 8 percent of the entire world's cases of monkeypox. And we mentioned that Montreal is the epicenter of the monkeypox outbreak in all of North America. So should Canadians be concerned, Dr. Rout? Well, I, I think the arrival of summer means we're going to have a lot of tourists flocking to Montreal as well in the coming months. Uh, I think both the city and the province do want to get a handle on the situation as soon as possible. We've seen already Quebec uh, announcing a vaccination campaign targeting those most at risk. Um, overall, as Dr. Butler says, there's one group in particular that's being affected, which is men who are having sexual relations with other men. Uh, and so what they are saying with this group is that they're likely seeing these cases because there has been always uh, positive health seeking behavior in this demographic. So overall, what we would say is looking at these groups here, we're not seeing huge change of transmission outside those groups at this point. So from a safety perspective, I don't think we need to be too worried here. All right. And as you mentioned, a lot of people are interested in uh, traveling to Montreal for tourism. So what can tourists do to be extra safe if they're traveling to Montreal this summer? Right. I think we've uh, learned a lot of lessons from COVID-19 with this, washing our hands very frequently, uh, avoiding contact with infected uh, individuals, uh, wearing a face mask, avoiding wildlife, because there is that concern with monkeypox there. Uh, and finally, getting vaccinated uh, if you are part of the group that's most at risk as well. Uh, we know that vaccination has been stepping up in these communities as well in Quebec and Montreal, uh, and we think it's going to be very helpful in that way. So do you think people should consider maybe not traveling to Montreal during the summer season this year? Well, so we're, what we've seen so far is 126 cases in the metropolitan area of Montreal, which has a population of 4.2 million people. So I think from a statistical perspective, I don't think we need to worry too much about not traveling to Montreal quite yet. However, if we start seeing the cases double, quadruple, and then you know take on an exponential level, then of course that's a different story. And uh, you mentioned a little earlier uh, the targeted vaccination campaigns in Montreal and other cities. Uh, should officials consider mass vaccination against monkeypox in Canada? I think that's an excellent question. Uh, should we be looking really at mass vaccination rather than targeted immunization? Uh, so far, experts agree that targeted is the way to go. Uh, you want to do targeted immunization if you, one, have a high level of cases in a certain group, and two, you don't and probably won't have the vaccines to even consider mass vaccination for a long period of time. So based on limited resources that we would have with our own smallpox vaccines, I would expect that we will focus primarily on targeted vaccination campaigns. All right. And on the topic of vaccinations, we know uh, that the WHO's technical lead for monkeypox mentioned that uh, most data on smallpox vaccinations is old. So what else is still needing? To, what else do we still need to learn about uh, monkeypox vaccinations, Dr. Rout? 
Yeah, I think there's a lot we need to learn about monkeypox in general. A lot of the data has been quite old there. Uh, you know, as a physician, I'm always concerned about the effects of uh, a new disease on vulnerable groups. Uh, we we want to look at children, pregnant women as well. And of course, with vaccines, we don't actually have a monkeypox vaccine. We're relying on smallpox vaccines to provide that immunity. So a lot more to learn in that domain. All right, Dr. Rao, Medical Director at Apple Tree Medical Group. Always great having you on Forum Daily, sir. Thanks again, and we'll see you again next week. Thanks so much for having me. Coming up after the break, we'll be taking a look at Wall Street as it moves back into the claws of a bear market. Between rising interest rates to try to control inflation, to war in Ukraine and a slowdown in China's economy, investors have been forced to reconsider what they're willing to pay for a wide range of stocks. From high-flying tech companies to traditional automakers and many more, our interview with Sejal Patel, financial analyst, consultant, and the host of Strictly Money is coming up next. So don't go anywhere. We'll be right back shortly. Wall Street is back in the claws of a bear market. This comes as worries about inflation and higher interest rates overwhelm investors. The Federal Reserve has signaled it will aggressively raise interest rates to try to control inflation, which is the highest in decades. Add to that the war in Ukraine and a slowdown in China's economy, and investors have been forced to reconsider what they're willing to pay for a wide range of stocks, from high-flying tech companies to traditional automakers. On Monday, the S&P 500 fell 3.9 percent and closed nearly 22 percent below its January 3rd high. With us to unpack the looming bear market is Ms. Sejal Patel, financial analyst, consultant and host of Strictly Money. She joins us now. Sejal, welcome to Forum Daily. Nice to see you, Nima. So for our viewers who may not be uh, familiar with this term, can you unpack bear market for our viewers? Sure. So... So um, a stock market is considered to be in bear market territory when it is down 20% or more from its recent um, recently hit high, right? So if you look at a couple of markets, um, the S&P 500 in the U.S., and we look at the U.S. markets because it is the world's largest uh, capital market, the S&P 500 is down about 20% from its recent peak hit in January. If you look at the NASDAQ, which of course follows the big tech heavyweights um, like your Facebook or, or Meta or um, Alphabet, which is the parent of Google, as well as Amazon, that market is down 30% from its um, last peak, which was hit in November of last year. Now, the TSX uh, Composite Index here in Canada, we're not in bear market territory, at least not yet. It's down about 10%. And part of the reason there is because it is heavily weighted towards resources and oil, and we know that oil prices are up. So it's, it's lending a little bit of support for that market. Good to know that uh, things are a little smoother here in Canada. Now, a lot of attention is on the U.S. Federal Reserve's moves to raise interest rates. So how do such decisions from the Fed impact global markets? Yeah, so the Federal Reserve and the interest rates, I guess the big concern is that um, interest rates are going up and likely going even higher. Right. And and the reason for that, Nima, not just in the US and Canada, but frankly, most markets around the world, is there's hope that higher interest rates will tame up runaway prices and in inflation and bring it back to reasonable levels. The complication with that, there's a couple of things. One, it's it hasn't worked, at least not yet, right? If you look at recent numbers um, out of Canada and the U.S., the trajectory is still higher. In fact, in in, uh, in the U.S., we got numbers north of eight percent um, last week, and there was hope that it had peaked, and it means that uh, the Federal Reserve is taking a more aggressive stance. Now, we are going into a two-day policy meeting in the U.S. tomorrow. Uh, 50 basis point hike is pretty much baked in, but there's a lot of people saying that we could see a 75 basis point hike. I happen to be in that camp because uh, just because of the tone that we're seeing. Um, the last comment that I would make about the markets and what's really getting them nervous is that typically interest rates would work, right? It, it, the idea is that it tames demand down. The problem is that this is not just a demand-driven 
um, inflation. It, a lot of it has to do with supply disruptions. Um, as you talked about, right, in China, you've got hundreds and of thousands of cargo ships sitting there. Uh, the the Russian-Ukraine conflict is affecting oil prices, and that's a disruption. So there's still the verdict uh, out there of whether these interest rate hikes are going to work. The only thing is the central bank's policy or mandate is to use interest rates. So that's the, the toolbox that they use, and, and that's what they're doing. All right, Sejal, about a minute left here, but are there any ways that investors can prepare for a bear market? Are there any uh, particular investments to consider at this time? I know there's a lot of interest around cryptocurrencies right now. Yeah, so what I would say is um, try to gain some perspective, right? Um, We've had 14 bear markets since World War II. I've been in the financial industry for 20 years. I've seen um, at least seven in my days. And and while we see market corrections, we also see market rebounds. So unless you need the money right now, don't sell, right? It, it's easy to look at your portfolio and see that it's down, but it's just a number. You haven't realized it unless you sell. Um, remember that the stock market is a longer term game and we should see a recovery. We just don't know when it's gonna happen. Uh, and for those who are looking at the markets, again, you can't time the bottom. We don't know when the bottom's gonna happen. So a couple of good strategies, dollar cost average in, right? If you're looking at low cost index funds or ETFs or mutual funds, um, if you wanna be more active, go more defensive, right? Defensive plays that do well, regardless of the economy, mm -hmm. um, that should help as well. Earlier this week, China's ambassador to Australia said relations between the two countries are at a new juncture. This with the election of a new Australian government and the first minister-to-minister -minister talks in more than two years. Ambassador Xiao Qian gave an upbeat assessment of their relationship potential in a speech on Saturday. And on Sunday, China's defense minister held an hour-long meeting with his Australian counterpart on the sidelines of a regional security summit in Singapore. Now, despite these steps, observers are wary of describing the meeting as a thawing of a diplomatic deep freeze between the two countries. Well, joining us now to discuss the significance of this is Ms. Cleo Pascal, Indo-Pacific expert and non-resident fellow at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. Ma'am, welcome back to Forum Daily. Thank you very much for having me. Now, China and Australia recently engaged in Pacific Island hopping tours in the, in the region. So what are both sides looking to gain here? So in the case of China, it was a big trip by Wang Yi, who's their foreign minister, and he went to physically to eight Pacific Island countries. So the map you had up before with the red band, that was those were the exclusive economic zones in the countries that he visited. And if you look at that map, you can see that you know if they maintain or get stronger relations with those countries, they've created a band that makes it possible to interdict Australia and New Zealand in the case of conflict. If they have their fishing fleets, their maritime militia, and some naval installations in those locations, even if it's just under the guise of humanitarian assistance and disaster response, they can make it very difficult for the Australians. And the Australians are, for their part, trying to, I think, uh, regain some of what they think should be their rightful place in the region. Whether the Pacific Islanders uh, feel that they have a rightful place there or not is what's being decided currently. And to that point, you mentioned in an article on the, uh, in the Sunday Guardian that China is engaged in entropic warfare in the region. So can you tell us a little bit more about this entropic warfare? Right. So the word um, entropy, or, or in, the, in this context, entropic warfare, means fragmentation, disintegration, the creation of a state of chaos. And what China seems to try to do in target countries is, is dissolve destroy, weaken the social and economic and political fabrics of the country so that it's easier for their influence operations to be effective. So that might be through social media operations, through taking over key sectors, through disrupting supply chains. This might all sound very familiar um, to, to people in North America because uh, we've also been the target of some of these entropic warfare operations. And in the, in the case of the Pacific Islands, they took a country like the Solomon Islands, which was relatively stable two years ago when it was in recognition of Taiwan, it flipped to China. And within those two years, they created a state of such internal chaos that uh, there were riots there. And that justified the authoritarian government bringing in PLA police trainers. 
So it can happen very quickly, creating a state of chaos that justifies an authoritarian government to become even closer to Beijing and bring in military, if not police, to help put down political dissent. And what do we know so far about the moves made by Australia's newly elected government? So we're all watching uh, quite closely. The, the, the language is kind of interesting. You know, they say they want to step up and they're blaming a lot on previous administrations. But China's toll in the region was a, a bipartisan success. <laughs> I mean, it took, it took two decades of every political party in Australia not handling this well for China to get such a strong toehold. So the situation won't be uh, remedied if that's the desire coming out of Canberra quickly. And hopefully what they say they want to happen, which is to create a situation that's more uh, prosperous and stable and secure for the people of the Pacific actually does happen. But it needs to be watched very closely. And for our viewers here in Canada, what's at stake in this dispute? So this is the front line between Asia and the Americas. You know, this, these, are, these islands, Solomon Islands, is the location of the Battle of Guadalcanal. It'll be the 80th anniversary of the Battle of Guadalcanal this summer. These are highly strategic locations. If, if it comes to conflict over Taiwan, for example, we know that China is looking to secure its position in the Pacific Islands to be able to have a buffer so that uh, allies can't get to Taiwan in order to be able to help the people of Taiwan remain democratic and free. So there, it's a very strategically important location that affects the balance of power across the Indo-Pacific and the success and uh, ability of democracies to sustain themselves. All right, Ms. Cleo Pascal from FDD, thank you again for joining us today on Forum Daily. Thank you for having me. All right, I'm Nima Rajan, and that'll do it for your look at important conversations from this past week. Remember, for more news on demand, you could always visit our website, thenewsforum.ca, and be sure to follow us on Facebook, TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter. Thanks for joining us on the Forum Daily Week in Review. Take care, Canada. We'll see you next time.